Owner of a seven-figure advertising agency for fitness studios and independent gyms, today's guest is no stranger to success. He has achieved his own entrepreneurial dream and his company, Loud Rumor, is responsible for the success of fitness and wellness companies worldwide. And that's not all. His video podcast, The Goat Show and The GSD Show, feature interviews with some of the most influential people in the world of fitness, business, sales, social media, and much more. So please welcome entrepreneur and advertising specialist and show host, Mike RC to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. And thanks for making it over here. What are you doing in San Diego? Same thing you are, right? <laughs> we're here for the Mind Body Conference, and it's, so it's an industry conference, and we like to be here. So I'm speaking at the conference, and then we've got a booth there as well. Right. And how long have you been working with the guys from Mind Body? Um, you know, I, I think like last year we started doing some stuff where I actually hosted a couple of their podcasts as well uh, for a little while, like 16 episodes or something. And um, that was just last year. Other than that, um, yeah, just really, I mean, it's, it, we're kind of, we have to work with them in some capacity because a lot of our customers use MindBody. So to integrate what we do on the advertising, the marketing side, we've had to like really get involved with them enough to, to make all that work. Right. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Mike. What early story, how did you get into advertising and fitness? Yeah, so I was in advertising first, and I'm sorry, fitness first, then I was in advertising. So um, at like 19, 20 years old, I, I, went, I was in school, I became a, I got a personal training certification through community college and I ended up getting like a total of four personal training certifications. I was really into it and I wanted to learn more and more about it. So as I became a trainer, I kept getting certified and um, eventually, you know, the numbers were good and the, the LA Fitness decided it was a good idea to put me in a um, position of management where I can help lead the trainers. And so they had me running certain clubs and um, I was the guy they basically put in the clubs that weren't doing uh, super well and hoping that I could drive it back up to the top three, top four. So I did that for a little while. Uh, I did the same thing over at Pure Fitness. And then um, then they took, then I started my own business, a uh, personal training company. Did that for a little while. Um, and then I moved into uh, advertising and marketing. I really liked the idea of, I realized that I was liking that more than anything else. I really liked the advertising. I liked the marketing, the sales. That stuff was really fun for me. I got a little arrogant and thought that you know, I could do that for anyone. It doesn't really matter who you are. Dentist, chiropractor, plumber, selling, marketing, advertising is the same. And, and even though it is, the solutions that you can provide, the help and the content to help them do better with it, it was just too overwhelming. So, and, and also the staff that you have, hiring them to uh, really learn about all the industries is really tough. So we niched into fitness um, since I had a background in it. And that was uh, early 2016, like the first January 2016. So now here we are, you know, coming up to the end of 2018, and uh, we've gotten to work with nearly a thousand fitness studios around the world, people in Hong Kong, people in Australia, uh, people obviously definitely in the U.S., Canada, um, and it's been really fun. Yeah. So just going back to setting up your own company, I heard that you didn't do it at the best time. There was a lot of change in the world. Mm -hmm. You had, your wife was pregnant with one of your children is that mm -hmm. is that correct yeah Tell I mean, us about that. <laughs> it was the best time for me it wasn't the best time if you had options but um at the time nobody was hiring my wife because she was five months pregnant and you know obviously they're not saying it's because of that but you know my wife's pretty she's got a good resume she's done good stuff in her career so it was kind of rough that she nobody was going to hire her my income had gone down because the economy went down so it went from you know i was making nine ten grand a month to now making like two to three grand a month and so even though it wasn't the best time to start a business, if you have options for us, because she wasn't going to get a job because, you know, I wasn't really going to find anything better than that at the time anyway, with the time crunch that we had, starting a business seemed like, that seemed like the only thing that we could do at that time. It was the best thing to do. And um, it was definitely tough, but I think it was the best thing that I could have happened to me because a lot of people over the last four five years, six years, they've started businesses and they become really successful. You know, I've seen a lot of people create other seven figure businesses in the last four or five years. The problem is um, they've kind of created a, I think if I started it four or five years ago, I would have created a false reality as to how good I think I might really be because oh, I got really, really good. But what's gonna happen when the economy goes back down? Inevitably it will, it always does, right? Every seven to 12 years it goes down again. So when that happens, are you, have you built a knowledge base around succeeding in any economy or in a successful one? Because right now it's easy, right? It's, it's like having really great genetics and saying like, wow, working out and getting shapes really easy. For you, you're 24 years old and you have lean body mass naturally, but what about the guy that's got 400 pounds to lose, right? He's fighting a much different current. So 
Um, for me, it was the best time because we didn't have an option and uh, you know, there was more pressure on me to succeed because of that. And I think I learned a lot. Now I've been in both the bad economy and a good economy and I feel like I'm ready for anything. Right. So give me your take on fitness then. You've, you've been working in a traditional big box, which I guess over the last sort of 10 to 15 years really exploded. And, and mm-hmm. you talk about niching down into you know, not looking at other businesses, but looking at fitness. But I also understand you've kind of niched down beyond that, even in the fitness mm-hmm. category. So a couple of questions then. So tell me what you're seeing going on in the industry and why did you decide yourself to, to, to be kind of niched down on those independent, the boutique fitness sector? Well, I, I liked the independent, the boutique when I first really laid eyes on it. It just made a lot of sense. Um, you know, you're charging a higher price point for what appears to be a higher quality service. Um, you're able to scale much faster and uh, more broad because you're not buying 60,000 square foot util- uh, 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 facilities. You're buying 2,000, you know, 3,000 square foot facilities. So it's, it's easier to scale at that point. You don't need to have 8,000 members like an LA Fitness would have at 20 bucks a pop. You know, you can have 400, 500 members at, you know, uh, 150 bucks a pop and actually be doing really well profit wise enough to be able to open up your next studio, second, third, fourth studio. So I, I liked it. I liked also for the customers. I felt like uh, working at Big Box and seeing fitness studios uh, as a general whole, people are getting in better results uh, percentage-wise of the people that have memberships at a group facility versus a uh, big bo- as part of the Big Box. They literally have activation percentages where like how many people actually check in on a monthly basis. And uh, you'll be surprised to hear like how many people have memberships and don't even go to the gym. It's like 20, 30 bucks. Right in fitness studios, if they don't go, if they don't go to the gym after a month or two, most of them cancel. Right. So you're you're not wasting the consumer's time or money. Um, if they're there, they're working out real hard every minute that they're there, and they're not stopping to watch a TV and all the other stuff. Right, so you're not wasting their time while they're there, and you're not wasting their money because the hundred fifty dollars you know that gets charged your credit card that rings a bell over a twenty dollar charge. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I felt like people were getting results faster. I, pe- I felt like the business was making money in the more responsible way. Not to say that there's anything wrong with the big box because a lot of people do come back and all that. But um, I don't know. For me, I just felt like I, I like that idea better. We want to get the world in shape a lot better. If that's what we want to do, then I felt like that was where the money should be. Yeah. As a younger entrepreneur being starting up a business, how important is it, do you think, to kind of narrow down who you go after in this day and age. I, I guess, you know, if you look at ex- Amazon being the exception, mm-hmm. but if you look at a lot of areas, whether it's sort of coffee shops or restaurants or even fitness, there seems to be people where it's kind of, well, that's the studio for someone like me. Do, do you think in business, if you're a trainer thinking about opening your own facility or even sort of running your own client base, it's, it's important to narrow down or can you still get away with being quite broad? What's your view on that? I think it depends on how you do things. I think when you first start you should be niche. I mean, you talk about Amazon. Amazon was niche. They started as a book selling company. They sold books. That's all they sold. Did you know that? I, I did, yeah, but I, didn't, I guess I didn't think sold, about it that right? way, yeah. And so once they built success around that, they were able to expand into other you know, avenues that just seemed to be parallel. It made sense, and, and then everything makes sense once you have more parallels, then everything's parallel to something. Eventually, now they sell anything, right? Um, Google was a search engine. That's all they were. Then they became an ad platform. You got Calendar, you got Gmail, you got Docs, you got everything, right? Um, Sony started out, I think it was like rice, they were a rice cooker. Right, I think yeah, that's how they that's started. True. They were like, they sold rice cookers. That's all they sold. And now you got people playing video games with people all over the world through Sony's products. So I think it's important to start niche. And then, and with that, that, that was one of the reasons I, the, the name of my company is Loud Rumor. It wasn't where we started, it was a web design company. That's what we started as. We didn't go Phoenix Web Design. I think a lot of people do it for SEO, right? Like, oh, then if somebody searches that, I didn't care about that. I cared about being able to be flexible and being able to pivot if I needed to, like Google was, right? If they just said uh, search engine worldwide or something, it's weird for them to have a calendar. It's weird for them to have a phone. It's weird for them. But Google could be, you know, anything. Starbucks could do whatever they want down the road, right? So uh, all those names, Yelp, Snapchat, Twitter, all, all those names mean nothing really. They all have a background meaning to it, but in reality it allows you to expand. So I think if you're gonna name your fitness studio something like, like Orange Theory, right? Great name, because that you can expand. If you wanna go into spin, you can go into spin. If, and they may never do it, but if they wanted to, they could, because it wasn't like 
hit training us right or something it, it allows him to pivot so i uh i don't think you need to to be niche and stay niche i think it's a smart idea to start niche and really know your market and know what you do well like get really great at something and then as opportunities come up once you've mastered this thing and you've really begun scaling it then i think it makes sense to add we've done it you know we, we started as a do-it-yourself service when we niche the fitness now we're teaching people how to do it um, we're having our own conferences and events um, we've also expanded out the massage and cryotherapy therapy as well as we've realized it could be relative. It's still parallel, right? Cause it's about health and wellness. And you know, five years from now, I, I don't know if we'd expand into more than that, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. So yeah. you certainly, I, I guess the takeaway from me is, is it's a good place to start. You can probably dominate a niche a lot easier. Yeah. And, and then, you know, based on that success, it, it's a lot easier for you then to kind of move into other parallel complementary areas, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Uh, and you could stay niche and be successful. Like McDonald's, for the most part, stayed pretty niche. And they've stayed successful. Starbucks, for the most part, stayed pretty niche. And they've been successful. But I think, you know, I think it's both ways works well. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of marketing, or, or let's, let's, let's think about it. So you open a facility, you've spent you know, whatever, from 200,000 to 2 million on it, it's, it, it's, it's a big investment. And one of the key things you need to do is get people through the door. Mm-hmm. Um, what changes have you seen from when you, were in, when you came into the industry to what's, what you're seeing now in terms of effective ways of getting people through the door? To advertise? Yeah, or whatever. Anyway. So nothing's really changed. Uh, in the last two years is what you asked, right? And so was from when you came into the fit, so when you were oh, working okay. as a trainer, what would you say is oh, some of the changes? Oh, a lot's changed then. Yeah, because then. when I was working as a trainer, you're talking 13, 14 years ago, right? And so in that world, yeah, um, you know, you've got, I, I was handing out flyers at all, people at different gyms. I was catching people outside of a gym. You want to get in the mine, in the parking lots. Um, I was putting out flyers in all the different delis. Um, I was, I was, you know, I was cold calling like random people that within miles of a, of a gym that I was working at and getting to come in. They're very different. You know, now I still do cold calling. I cold call when I'm bored, but, um, on, on the other side of it though, you can run ads and you can run, you can use the internet. The internet's something that no, everybody that's watching and listening right now, just know that if you're not spending money on the internet, like a good amount of money on the internet, you're wasting a lot of money. You're wasting a ton because you should be making money that you're not making. And, you're, and that's a lost opportunity. And it's going somewhere because those people are going to work out. Right. They're just not going to work out with you. Right? The guy that, that's hungry is still going to eat. It's just where is he going to eat? The guy that needs shoes is still going to get shoes. It's just where is he going to get shoes? Right? And the guy that decided he's in pain because a four-year-old kid j- just asked his wife, you know, hey, are you pregnant? And she's not pregnant. Right, that woman that's in pain right now is going to get a gym membership somewhere. She's going to start today. Right, it's just where she's going to start. So with that, I think uh, internet advertising allows you to do short game and long game. And I think right now, the the, the last since the internet's really started coming up. Over when the you last say internet, years. just to be specific, what 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 do you Facebook, mean? Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Google, right? right? Okay. Internet internet advertising like that. Um, predominantly Facebook. Facebook has got the, the most volume right now. It's got the most activity. Instagram comes in with cost per leads right around the same price, but you're not going to get the volume, but it's still worth it, right? Because you're still paying the most per, uh, the, you're still paying the same per lead. YouTube is really great for the branding. It will generate leads, but what people don't realize is where it really generates leads more is in an indirect fashion where now because they've seen you on YouTube so many times, when they see your ad on Facebook, it's not like this cold business I've never seen before. I've seen you so much before now that when I see your ad, it's like, oh, that place is having a promo, not this place is having a promo. It's like, oh, that place I've seen before. I've been looking at their stuff. They're having an offer as opposed to the random place, right? So I think a lot of people just play the short game. And so with the short game, it's like the treadmill, right? If you just want to lose weight by being on the treadmill, you will lose weight. If you just want to do cardio, you will lose weight. It's going to come back on though. You know that, right? Like that's not going to permanently get you in shape. You will lo- we'll put the weight back on, no problem. As soon as you stop doing cardio. Weight training, strength training, great nutrition, all that stuff is really, it's the full fundamentals, right? And that gives you the long term and the short term. Same thing with marketing. With marketing, you want to play the long game and the short game. If you're just running ads with offers and that's all you're doing, then all you're going to get is a short-term benefit. You're on the treadmill. Those ads stop, you stop. 
Right. right. So it's very much just sort of like direct response. You know, we've got an offer coming and... Yeah, like on like, Facebook, you see an ad for a free week at Orange Theory Fitness. Right. Um, on Google, you type in Orange Theory or you type in Fitness Studio and then they have a promo. On Instagram, you see an offer for a 30 for 30 pass, something like that. Right. So, if so that's what your class is, short term... Yeah, it's a treadmill. Right. You, you, will, you will get results on the treadmill, but as soon as you stop the treadmill, as soon as you stop the ads everything goes back to the way it was over a short period of time. Okay. The long-term play is what you see like with Nike and Apple and Starbucks and all these, like at the end of the day, 40 years from now, if you never saw Nike ad between now and 40 years from now, would you be able to still know the Nike logo, what they do and all that stuff? Yeah? yeah. How, about, how about Apple? 40 years from now, would you still know Apple? Yeah. Absolutely. Would you still know Starbucks? Okay, well, I bet you you remember more of those people's branding ads than you remember their uh, offer ads. Something tells me that you can't really remember the last Nike ad that you saw, like it, like call to action, 30% off, but you can remember a lot of the video, like the, 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 whether it's the Michael Jordan videos or whether it's a Serena Williams video that just came out now, right? Um, Apple, you'll probably remember the, I'm Apple, I'm a PC, right? You'll probably remember that kind of stuff, but you won't remember like, what kind of promos you're running necessarily because those don't stick no. because they know it's a promo. Your mind naturally knows it's a short term. So it doesn't log it the same way. There's no emotional, no, nothing's pulling at the heartstrings. So a lot of these small businesses, they haven't put the, that math together yet. They're still focusing so much on running ads because to get business in today and because we're an instant gratification world now because that's what our, you know, our phones have taught us and trained us to become is like, I can get anything right now. I want it now and then that's it. It's gone because everything's pulling for my attention. They, they forgot how important branding was and is today. And so if more businesses are, stu are able to do more branding videos, more heartfelt stuff or more memorable stuff, even if it's funny like the Old Spice guy does, right? Old Spice always, you know, remember that guy was like, hello ladies, remember? And, and he was like with a towel and now they have all these weird commercials that they do, the Dollar Shave Club video. These are companies that you, most people didn't even know of or they were like on the back of the shelf before. And then all of a sudden, poof, everything went up once branding kicked in. At the end of that commercial, they didn't say like, you know, at, at, for the Old Spice, they didn't say like, if you call today, we'll have 20% off. They didn't do that. They just ended it funny and it made you feel good, right? So how does, uh, uh, just, just stop you for a second then. So if you are a small company relative and you've got these big brands around you that can do that branding, how, how can you turn or justify the, the long game, the branding stuff when it's like, look, at the moment, I just need to get people in the doors. You know, how, how do you balance those two off? And is the branding a... Is is that expensive to do and difficult if you are a sort of small startup? It's expensive not to do it, long term. Put it this way: in two years from now, if you started today doing more branding than you've ever done, in two years from from today, you will get a lower cost per lead on your ads because Apple is running an offer, not this random computer company is running an offer. You see the difference right there? Right. So you are becoming a name in your five mile radius. Cause you can average, I can run branding campaigns just to a five mile radius. I don't have to do it to the world like Apple does. So it's cheap to do a five mile radius, right? So I can get everyone in the town to know me, who I am, all that stuff. In two years from now, I'm gonna have a lot of organic leads. People going straight to my website, people coming right into my business. Then you will, if you're just running ads and offers. And then when I run ads and you run ads, I'm gonna have a lower cost per click because more people are gonna click. I'm gonna have a lower cost per lead because more people are gonna enter my landing page. I'm gonna build a larger retargeting list that can run ads to even better. And I'm gonna have a higher sales closing ratio because when they come into my studio, it's like they've been here before. I've seen this place. That familiarity helps you close a sale a lot more than if you walk into a strange place. That's uncomfortable for a lot of people being in a new place. Discomfort helps close sale, or helps destroy sales. Right. No, the, the uncomfortable minds don't buy. So you want to eliminate anything and everything that could be uncomfortable for that person. And lack of familiarity and strange is uncomfortable. Right. What are some of the examples of when you talk about branding? <laughs> and I'm going to sort of take this to a basic level and assume people don't understand that word, but what would be branding for, you know, I'm Matthew, I've got a PT, small group studio in San Diego. What would branding mean for me? So let, let's say you, inv if you're gonna invest in marketing, right? Let's say you were gonna do like a, a big video, right? You spend a lot of money on that video. You spend a lot of money on the props for that video. You might be 25 grand in, right? Well, what if, what if we can not spend so much in the video, but we get the story to be really cool, right? And so now let's say I come into your gym 
and let's say I'm 300 pounds, right? And I, I got to get down to 180, which is where I was. I'm a five foot eight guy and I let myself go dramatically and, and I'm uncomfortable and I got health issues now and everything's just piling up now as I'm getting older. So I'm 300 pounds and you, and you ask me questions, right? You get to the pain point. The guy that's 300 pounds, he's got health issues. Now I'll tell you right now, if you dig as a salesperson, you're going to be able to get that person to probably cry, right? Which is good. It's healthy. It's a healthy way to start that relationship, right? We're opening up. At that point, that's your opportunity to say, hey, look, I want to help you get there. I want to remove every obstacle that can hurt you from getting there. I love your story. Here's what I want to do. I'm not going to charge you a penny. I want you to work out here for free. I'm going to get you lined up with my best trainer. I'm going to take care of you so you get your results. You are going to get there. Okay? I'm going to make sure you have the best workout, the best nutrition program we could put together for you. Right now, this guy's going to start crying even more. Right? Right, right about this point, he's like so in shock that this is happening. He, he's crying. Right? And you say, before I go on, how's that sound to you so far? Uh, it sounds amazing. I can't believe it. Is it. Right? He's going to say something like that. Say, and more importantly, because I know you're going to do it. And I know you're going to be able to inspire the lives of so many other people that didn't have the guts to do what you did today. I would like to ask your permission to document it. I'd love to video this journey. What's that guy going to say? Yeah. There's your branding video. In six months to 10 months, maybe a year, maybe two years, as you can keep evolving it, you've got the best video of what your gym was actually able to do for somebody from day one on. Right. Right. So that's, so that's branding where it's like take, taking, and you, I guess story, people can create the, the stories streets. themselves, can't they? I suppose right. you, know, you don't necessarily, although you can go and get a company like yourself, these are probably things that they can do themselves to mm-hmm. build that story. Um, and then you've got the ads, which is come in two for one or whatever, whatever mm-hmm. they are. So I think what you're saying is there's, there's two strategies. You I'm probably... not going to remember the two for one in 10 years. I'll remember that story right. in okay. two years. So what about then, and, and, and I'm talking particularly at the moment for the smaller uh, clubs, independent, small boutiques, that type of thing. What do you think are the opportunities for that type of sector going up against people that have probably got you know, these huge multi-million dollar beautiful facilities mm-hmm. that have got everything there? What, you know, can these small people move quicker, outmaneuver some of, those, some of their competition, do you think? Yeah, it's all about feeling. Feeling is why people buy. It, the, the mind just rationalizes it. It's your heart and your gut that makes your decision. So, so you know, if you ever, if you ever like looked at everything on paper and all your friends, like everything makes all the sense in the world. Everyone says you should do it and it doesn't feel right. So you don't do it. Okay. Well, your mind, if your mind was in control, you'd have made the decision on yes, because your heart and your gut had more control. You said no. And vice versa. How many times has everybody said, don't do it. Don't do it, Matthew. Don't do it. But it feels like the right thing to do and ah, forget it, I'm going to do it anyway. Right? Have you ever had that? Right? Yeah. Maybe starting a business. So the gut makes the decision. The brain just rationalizes to make sure it's not too dangerous. But for the most part, if there's a sign of hope, some people will just go ahead and do it or not do it right? because of the gut. So now that we know that, it's all about the feeling. Now, as soon as somebody walks into a door in a beautiful facility, yes, my feeling advantage is greater than yours if you don't have that. And that's why I do believe people should spend money on their you know, facility. You got people coming in here every day, make them feel good, right? Spend money on it. Now you can't maybe not be able to do that right now. Then you've got to double down on everything else that can drive good feelings, right? How do I feel when I'm around these instructors, right? Can the story switch from that person? Like, oh, I don't care about the big fancy stuff. Like this place cares about me, right? Um, How do I feel after my workout? How do I feel when I get a text message from my trainer 10 minutes after saying, hey, just want to let you know today was a great workout. You're crushing it. Keep doing that work, right? How would I feel? Because if, I, if my feeling is able to be just as strong or better than a big facility that doesn't give me all that other stuff, well, then that's, that's what I'm buying. Right. I'm not buying the other stuff. How many people do you see married to people that aren't the most, I mean, it's impossible for everyone except for one person to be, attracted to, to, to be married to the most attractive person in the world, I am. right? Technically, you are. Okay, so now, now that means, so my, I am too, so we'll have to figure that out. But you can't, there's, there's only one most attractive person in the world, right? So how is everybody, how does so many people get married? Because it's not about how it looks all the time. It's about how it makes you feel. Yeah. And because it makes you feel better, the way that thing looks, looks better, right? I'm definitely not the most handsome guy in the world. But my wife thinks I'm up there. That's good. I make her feel good. 
So for you, how can you make your studio look and feel like the best thing in the world so that the feeling can elevate everything else about it? The whole perspective around it changes because of the way you make them feel. Vice versa, how many beautiful people make other people feel like shit? Yeah. Now they become, a, how many, you may have done this, I don't know how long you've been married, but I've done it where, and I know other people have done, everyone's done this, where you know, you're, you're dating somebody that's super attractive to you and then all of a sudden they do you wrong or they, they start messing up. And now later on, you're like, how, did I, how was I attracted to that person? Mm. How did I see that person that way? You saw that person that way because that person made you feel a way to where they were attracted to you. Now they made you feel a way that where they're just unattracted to you. Yeah. The feeling is what gets you to buy or move away and go to a competitor. Yeah. And I think what, just listening to that, I think what, what you're sort of saying is that, you know, the perception is okay, which which is how I've explained. It. It's a big club. It's beautiful. They spent a lot of money on it, and I, I guess what we, what I was doing in that statement is narrowing it down to a couple of things. I think what you're saying is, look, yes, it's nice to be attractive as, as a facility, but you know, build out your story so you're a lot more. You know, you've yeah, got you personality. Get to both, great. You, you, you can you can sort of build that story. Okay, that make, and that's a good one as well because I think again, people coming into business for the first time, new entrepreneurs, you, you, know, you can get intimidated by competition. You know, you've opened a great facility, you're probably offering an awesome service. Some brand op opens up a, a, across the road with you and it can be intimidating. Shit, how am I gonna deal with those guys? Mm -hmm. But you know, they may not have their processes and their, their interaction with the clients as good as you. And it's, I, I guess what you're saying is, you know, get your camera and start showing those examples because they're probably, they may not be doing that. You have a good right to be afraid of the competition opening up across the street if your focus is on tactics and not overall strategy. Right. If you're focused on the tactics like, oh man, what kind of ads are they gonna run? What kind of offers are they gonna run? Well, then your focus has now been removed from the customer. As soon as your focus is removed from the customer, you're dead meat. Even if your offer is better, you're dead meat. You can, you can charge more than them. Uh, you can have less availability and still keep most of your people if they believe that you care about them more than those other guys. Yeah. If they believe that this, I, I can't leave here. Like my kids aren't considering another dad, <laughs> you know, like they're not considering another dad. Like there's a lot of other dads out there. They're, they're not even like, it's not even a thing. Right. And that's because like, how do I care about them? How do I make them feel? Can they count on me? Do they know I'm proud of them? Do they know that they've got work to do to constantly make me proud of them? Do they like living up to that? The answer is yes. As a trainer, you can do all those things. You can care about your people. You can be proud of your people. You can hold them accountable to doing greater, to continue that pride from develop, to, to develop. Um, you can set expectations for them and believe in them more than they believe in themselves. You can do all those things. You can do that as a trainer. You can do that as an employer with your team. Your, your team. You can do that as a father with your kids. You not could, you should do all that. And then you should be looking for people to do it for you as well. Yeah. Because your, your trainers <clears throat> or the gym owners here, they're not gonna be able to do that without them finding mentors and coaches to be able to do that to them as well. They, they gotta be pulled up so they can be, keep pulling people up. Otherwise, if I'm, if I'm just hanging and nobody's pulling me up, I can only pull up somebody to my level tops. All right. But if I can keep, keep getting pulled up and I can keep getting pulled up and I keep pulling up, then over the course of time, like we're all going to a really cool, cool place, right? right? Your, your trainers, your, 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 employer, your employees, your clients, your family, all that. So you mentioned mentors, and let's let's talk, stay on that subject for a moment. So you're, you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at your podcast. You have some great people on there, um, and from from various different types of business, and and really able to, I guess, you know, help you think in different ways and and develop yourself. What's your view on mentors? How do you use them, and and what's your advice to people that are getting involved in business about how they should interact with someone that could probably develop them their mentally? It's been the only reason I've been successful. It's been the only reason I've been successful. You could say, oh, well, Mike, you had to go do the work. They just showed you the way. Yes, they're the ones that motivated me to do the work. They're the ones that set the tone on how you should work. And I started realizing that I'm underdoing it. I could do more. I'm being, I'm, I'm, I'm being underrated on my own self, right? So the reason I have my podcast, The Goat Show, the reason I have that is because I want free mentorship as much as I, I want to meet people that are the greatest of all time, Goat, right? The greatest of all time at what they do. So, you know, uh, two days ago, two days ago, we got to interview somebody that's got $8 billion in, in his businesses, $8 billion. Do you know how much he can pull me up just in a conversation, right? Um, we, we got to interview another guy that has literally made $50 million in his online training course, just online training course, uh, and started doing it for others. Um, 
you know, today we're getting to talk, right? And so in this case, I'm going to learn from you, right? It's just, you got you want to meet people that are doing things. You can get mentored by people that aren't even as successful as you. It's just, they may be more successful than you in one area. So like Kelsey, you know, she could teach me more than I could teach her about PR, right? Or, or like, you know, how to reach out and like all the different platforms and stuff. So even though in this particular case, like in our company on the org chart, I'm higher up than she is as an overall whole, like I can learn from her here. You know, I learned from Sam. I learned from McKenna. I can learn from all the people. So you can get mentorship. You don't have to look for an $8 billion guy. You can just look for people that are doing something better than you. You can get mentorship by one of your trainers, right? You, you could own a gym and one of your trainers could just have the highest retention rate out of everyone. He could, he could have the best ratings. People are constantly saying like, oh, that guy, Jeremy is amazing. He's so awesome. You got to keep him. You got to keep him. And instead of just saying like, yeah, he is good. You should go and sit down with Jeremy. Hey, what are you doing? How are you doing this? Everyone's saying you're amazing. Well, I just do this. No, you say you just do this, but no one's doing that. Tell me about it. What do you think? Can I shadow you for a day? Because now if you can get the whole business to do that, you just got mentored by Jeremy on how to build better culture. Yeah. So you don't have to find $8 billion people. But I, I found, I, I started the Go Show. Every question I ask in that show is for me. And, and everybody that benefits from it, I share it with the world. That's great. But all those questions I ask, I want to know the answer to. That's for me. I get coaching. You watch some of the episodes I do. You could see if you watch it with that mindset, you could be like, Mike's asking me. He's learning right now. <laughs> he's getting coached. He doesn't even know it. The, the guest doesn't even really know it. He's getting coached right now. It's my own personal coaching journey you're watching. Yeah. And I guess the benefit of that is that you can... I guess you don't have to meet that person face to face. You can, you know, for free, you can stick on your earphones, you can listen to your podcast and, and you, can, you can get all of yeah, those benefits nowadays. Well, that's, so, so people ask that all the time too. Like, hey, what, I can't find mentors. I can't, but first off, you can. You can get mentored by a lot of people, but you should be mentored by people that are doing stuff that you can't do, right? Like they're better than you at that thing. So if you're making more money than your financial advisor, then you shouldn't be advised by that person, right? So, um, but when I started out, it was books. And when I read a book, I'm with that person. If you think about when you read a book, no matter what, if you've never heard that person's voice because you didn't know who he was as a speaker or anything, you create a voice in your head. And it's kind of weird when you do hear him speak. You're like, oh, wow, I didn't think you would be like that, right? But you create a voice in that person's head. And then for that while, that six or eight hours you invested in that book, you were with that person in the best way because you couldn't talk. You could only listen. Right? It's like the best type of mentorship. You can only listen. You can't tell your thoughts or ideas. You just listen. Po and if it's audiobook, you can d truly listen. Right? Uh, podcasts are great because you can choose like certain categories to dive deeper on. You want to learn more about video ads? You can just search for like anybody that was interviewed on video ads and just spend, get all different perspectives on it. So yeah, you can get mentored every day, all day if you want to. Just turn it on. Right. What's your view on podcasts for a, a small trainer, independent club? Is this something that people should think about? I know starting one or listening. Yeah, to starting it? one. Yeah. Um, Is I, it a branding strategy that people could do? So, you know, like I, I don't. You'll never really hear me say the f word in like a video or a podcast. And Gary Vee's proven that it can be it could do well for you, but I think you got to know yourself. If I started saying the f word, it would be inauthentic to me my team would be like, who's he trying to be? You know, like, why is he doing that? That's not, he doesn't do that, right? I'll say shit, but I won't say, you know, the F word is just not part of my vocabulary on a normal basis. And so um, for Gary, you can do him. For, for you, like, don't start a podcast because like you think it's a good tactic. Now you're moving away from the customers again. If you are a very articulate person, like when you teach people stuff, they listen or... You could tell people are able to understand what you're telling them, like, and you've got a good voice for that. Or if you like speaking, like you've maybe had a couple of clinics at your st studio and you could tell people were engaged, people were listening, people were telling you how great it was. Then at that point, it's like, how can I just create a microphone where I can get it out further? That's your thing. But maybe that's not your thing, right? So you should do where you thrive. That's it. And, and you've got to know there's other things about it. So I, I, I have zero fear with going up to anybody. That, eight, that guy with $8 billion, McKenna knows she was just there. That guy that we got on, we, I, I got him like an hour before we interviewed him. <laughs> I was walking around. I saw that guy. We've wanted him on the show. He bailed on us before. He's worth $8 billion. The guy's on stages all the time. I went up to him and I just said, hey, I love to have you on my podcast. You know, this is what we do. Can you come on? And he goes, yeah, let's do it. So I go, let's do 2.30. 
<laughs> I, I extended her flight. She was supposed to leave earlier. She left later, got it back to her suite. We did the interview and it was done, right? So you're going to have to get guests and you're going to have to have the guts to do it. Cold calling, you're going to have the guts to do it. And here's the thing that people don't understand too. We're calling people, whether it's cold calling for business, whether it's cold calling to vendors that you want to do business with or build a partnership with, like a, like a strategic partnership with, or whether it's for guests or a podcast or whatever, you've got to know that rejection is absolutely fake. It doesn't matter. It, it, it's all in your mind. It's BS. Because at the end of the day, let's say I cold call anyone for any reason, right? Customer, possible strategic partnership, guest, whatever. If they say no and I hang up, I'm in the same spot. My fridge has the same food in it. My car has the same gas in it. My, my people are eating the same thing. My kids still think the same thing about me. Everything's the same in my life. Zero things have changed with the exception of I got rejected and now that's messing with me. All right, like, oh man, I'm not perfect. At the end of the day, your, your life's the same. You can make 200 cold calls in a day and get hung up on every time. And really, everything's the same. Everything. So when I go up to this guy, this billionaire, at the end of the day, the worst he could say is, I don't have time for that. Great. I'm literally back where I was before I, saw, before I made eye contact with him. In the exact same spot. So you, I think a rejection is a, big, a hard thing for people to get over. Yeah. I think people spend time looking at their likes and who's liking their stuff. And then therefore, you start really focusing all your energy on likes. And, and that means who you are and it doesn't, right? At the end yeah. of the day, everything's safe. So if you're going to start a podcast, you're going to have to be pitching people. You're going to get rejected. People are going to have long deadlines before they can do it. And you got to be okay with that. Not think, oh man, my show sucks. No, your show doesn't suck. You suck. You just got to get better at getting you know, rejected and, and moving on to the next call. Yeah. And I think that's a good point that you mentioned there. You know, you've <laughs> got to not forget who your customers are. You know, I think it's easy to get so caught up in, in terms of, you know, what you're saying, your likes, who's looking at it. And even if I remember when we started ours, you know, I spoke to one of the guys you've had on John Lee Dumas and he was very much, look, you know, just focus on those few people, you know, that do a really good job, communicate. And I asked him, you know, if he, if he was to do it again, what would he do? And he said, look, I would just build a dialogue with those few people. And I think in business, it's very easy to, to lose focus about what your goal is. And I, you know, I like that point. Don't forget who your customer is and who you're serving. As long, <laughs> as long as you remember that, you know, everything you build is for that person. Everything you create is for that person. Every ad you get is to bring more of that person in and also to get that person appreciated. Um, and if you're doing that, you got a lot more success coming your way than if you're thinking about the sales being made. Yeah. Because then as soon as the sales made, mission's accomplished, right? So now all you're thinking about is the next sale. Now that guy, how many times have you felt that way where you bought something, you got, you got more attention on you as a prospect than you did as a customer. Have you ever felt that way? Like, oh, I got all these people calling me, calling me, calling me, calling me, calling me, calling me. I finally sign up and now no one calls me. Yeah. So let's talk about that point. So <laughs> you've got your new customers, you're opening up your facility or you've just had a refit and you want new people in there. What are some strategies? What should we be looking at for you existing people that you know, have already been sold, now they're in, um, you, want to, you want to retain them for longer? What, you know, how, what are some examples of what you're doing for, for those people? So I'll tell you what I'm doing. But before I start on that, you shouldn't have to think about that if, like hard if you really do care. Like if, you, if you really care about your kids, you don't have to think like, how can I make them feel good? How can I like, make them like me more? Because it's not about making them like you more. Now, if your strategy is to make them like you more, chances are you really don't care about them like you think. You care about yourself more than you care about them. You see that, right? right. It's like, how can I make my son like me more today? Uh, that's you. That's your selfish, right? How can, I make, how can I make my son have a fun time today? What can I do for my son that he'll really like today? How can I make him excited? How can I make him have a fun? How can I make him say it was the fun, best day ever? Well, that's him focus. So with your customer, it's the same thing. How can I get them to like my studio more? Is not the same as how can I help them more? How can I get them to be more passionate about fitness? How, how can I get them more committed to this? Those are two different things. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good point. <clears throat> so yeah. now the work changes. So now going into that, I'll tell you how I do it. So we do have our Facebook group, right? And in our Facebook group, uh, we just had somebody uh, ask a question like a few days ago. Uh, the question was, our competitor just left, right? Uh, they just got, they're going out of business, they're leaving. And I really want to find a way to capitalize on that. How can I get more of our mem their members to us? And so rather than typing this long thing, which for time that was hard to do, but I wanted to help her out, I not only uh, answered her question in a video, I replied in a comment in a video. It's like a three minute video of all the things that she could do. On top of that, I tagged a few other people that are in the group that I know have gone through this, said, hey, Zach, can you help her? I know you've had over 100 studios you've had to have gone through. I certainly have. And he went on and said all his stuff. 
My goal was not how can I get her to find value in me. My goal was how can I get her like this as fast as possible? She can get this. Like she's, that's a pain for her right now. How can I get her that? How can I get her that? And with that mentality, I believe we did that, right? And so within your Facebook group, like how can you give people more of what they want? Um, I had somebody approach me at Thrive and saying, hey, thanks so much. You made a video for me on YouTube. I don't know if you remember. And I don't because we've done that a few different times. But what he had said, and and I remember the video because he said to me, he said, you made a video on your perfect agency sales pitch. And I commented saying, this was amazing. Hey, Mike, what would you do if you had to start an agency all over again? And I said, great question. I'll make a video. And then like two days later, I had a video if I had to start an agency all over again. And I made a 40 minute video on it, right? My goal was not how to get him to buy my stuff. It was to get him to believe that I was, you know, going to help him. Like I was here to help him out and get him to be helped. And now that feeling tying back to feeling is what's going to help him remember me more to the point where it's been a year and a half since I made that video. He came up to me at thrive. I'm sitting there watching and he comes up to me and says, Hey, and tells me the whole thing. Right. A year and a half later, if I'd have showed him an ad about my course, he wouldn't have remembered me. No. No. So how would you apply that then to you know, me, Matthew Studio in San Diego? Um, I've got the customers in, you know, I want to look after them. What would, would, are you, would an example be that you would you kind of create your own Facebook community where you are? Mm-hmm. How can I help you? Is that, is that sort of a strategy that people could be thinking about? I'll ask you this question because you already know the answers, right? If I were to ask you, look, help them lose more weight today. Help them get more in shape help them want to work out more, help them change your perspective of fitness. What are some things that you think you do? Like I told you that right now, like Matthew, your whole legacy is going to be based on how many people you've helped, right? Everyone here, money will never be an issue. Your, your bank account has unlimited funds. Your pocket will have money in it. Even after you use it all, you go back in your pocket, more is in there. Okay. Now that you know that, would you see yourself working a little differently, right? It's not all about that anymore. Now, this is what I do. Okay. So what would you do? How would the conversations be when the person walks in for the first time? Would it be a little different? If that's your mission now, person walks in the door. Hey, how's it going? Good. How's your day been? Good. How's nutrition? Right. They tell you. And now it's not just, I'm going through the checklist. The person's like, ah, it's been really tough. Let's talk about it. What's been tough. Right. People are working out. You see somebody pulling through, you're complimenting them a little bit more. At the end of the day, are you going to be focusing on the ads to get new customers? Or are you going to be reaching out to your existing customers and just saying how great of a job they did today? Ask them, hey, what's getting in the way right now? Hey, I haven't heard from you in a few days. How's everything been? Like, just think about if you had unlimited funds and business will always grow naturally, and your legacy is going to be built off how many people you've helped, how would you run your day differently? Now that you know that, your conversations will be different. The videos that you make will be different. You'll probably have events where you can bring them all together so they can meet each other. We've done that, right, with our stuff. We had GSD Con, bring them all together. We bring in great speakers to teach them stuff that I don't think I'm good at as as much as these guys are, right? These guys, that they they spent their life being great at that one thing. Bring them in. Now I'm helping them with that thing, right? I find, how can I help this person, right? Your kids, bringing it back because we know how to do it naturally. We don't think about it with our kids because we actually unconditionally love our children. So if our child's having a hard time with school, we sit down with them and we go over it with them. If they still can't get it, we have a conversation with the teacher. If the teacher makes a recommendation of getting a tutor, we look for tutors, right? Yeah. So, so you're saying sort of change the way you're thinking about those existing people, change your, yeah. your, your, your approach. Your whole there. goal isn't just to get, you know, your son to work harder. That will be one of them, but it's not just, Hey, you know, selling them on working harder. It's how can I really help this kid? How can I get them here? What do we do as a routine? I was trying to teach my kid to learn how to spell because, because spelling's not his thing, right? So he can't remember spelling really well. And then I started like looking into the ways I can get him to, and I found an article that talked about it. Some people are visual, some people are auditory, some people are kinesthetic. So I realized my son's more kinesthetic. So I had to actually like have him like physically do stuff and he's able to remember it. He's since I've done that, that's been four spelling tests ago. He's never gotten higher than a 70 on a spelling test. He's literally gotten three of them were hundreds, meaning got them all right. This one, he got one wrong since just learning how to do that. And how does he feel right now? He's never drifting from that style of study again. That works for me because a feeling that's associated with success around something he's been failing at for so long, repeatedly, no matter what he felt he did, how many people in these studios, no matter what they did, no matter what they tried, no matter what diet, no matter what program, no matter what YouTube video, no matter what, they weren't able to get in shape or get anywhere. And now here's this one person that found this thing to get you there. 
Now, how do I think about you and myself? Yeah. And those, those sort of strategies that your company <coughs> offers to, to different club owners and independent businesses, they're, they're scalable, are they? Are they things that you can do? You know, I guess it's easy to do when there's just you and your partner running I it. I have four kids. I'm able to do it with all four of them. I right. scaled it past one. Right. Right. You can do it with all your members. All my members, all my customers at Loud Rumor, they all get it. Right? I'll send random video text messages to some of our, we have almost a thousand. If my account managers tell me that this person did something really amazing or something, yeah, we'll go ahead and send the video text. This one girl uh, on our account team, she told us that this person that she's working with, this studio owner, um, just got qualified for the Boston Marathon, which is a big deal for this person. She's super excited about it. And so the account managers are now starting to really understand like this caring thing. And she messaged me saying, hey, she just qualified. I really love this. Uh, I'm proud of her. I wanted to send her something to show how proud I am. You know, here are some things I saw on Amazon that are under like 15 bucks. What do you think? And I looked at one of them was a set of green socks. That's our company colors. And it says just run on the toe. And I was like, yeah, let's send her that in a card. So now we're sending her that in a card, right? Like it's not just about leads on Facebook. It's about like, hey, I'm in, we're, we're here with people, real people. The more we're real people, the more I care about helping you. Yeah. You know, you, you, does, it, does it feel better to push a button and donate $500 on a website to a place building schools? Or does it feel better to pick up the hammer and the nails and actually help build the school? What feels better? Yeah, the the hammer and the nails, right? But here's the deal. That $500 will be able to hire way more people than just you. You would have act, the $500 would have done more than you. The problem is it feels better to be involved, mm -hmm. right? It's that feeling. Feeling is everything, dude. Feeling is everything. So um, for everything else, you know, it's not just about all the tactics all the time. It's about like, what, how can I really get this person to, to be better, be yeah. feel better? And, and once you do that, then sometimes tactics build off of that as opposed to the opposite. Yeah. So you must have seen, you must look at a lot of companies in the business and you're obviously applying this and you know, you're judged on how successful you are at, you know, working with people and delivering results. What are some examples of people that are doing what you've said really, really well? Um, I think Starbucks does a really good, uh, it's a good example of it. I mean, they, they know the baristas know your name after a few times. Um, you know, they were the ones that really kicked off the whole Wi-Fi thing and made it a place where it's like your second home and you can go there and you could do work. Like you feel comfortable working there. You feel comfortable meeting people there. And, and even, if, even if you're not a coffee drinker, like you'll go there to work and drink a, a tea or something like that. Um, you know, I, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard a few different times that they'll spell your name wrong intentionally to be able to remember it better on the cup. And so some people don't get why their name spell weird, but like they'll spell it different to remember your name. So I thought that was really cool. And, um, you know, they're st they stay with the seasons. Like, you know, everything's like very seasonal. They do the red cup during the holidays or whatever. So I think they do a really good job of it. What about in the, in the sort of fitness in world? In the fitness space? Um, SoulCycle, I think, does a really great job of it. Um, because one of the hardest things is to be motivated and stay entertained and stay educated. And so what SoulCycle did is they didn't hire uh, spin instructors and then like hope they were great at like keeping the crowd engaged. They actually hired actresses, actors, comedians, entertainers. They hired them and then they taught them how to spin and how to run a spin class. That's what they did. They went backwards because they realized that the hardest thing was not how do I spin? I mean, we've been riding bikes since we were kids. The hardest thing was how do I get through this shitty 45 minute workout where I want to get off, but I can't because it's a group thing. It's weird to just get off and go, right? So how can we do it? Keep me entertained, right? It, a long, I was just on a long plane ride, had a great conversation. This girl, Felicia, that's on our, it's kind of works with us. And we were on a, a plane, it was like an hour long plane ride. Now, the same time it took me to get here, right? To, to San Diego, it was the same one hour distance. I felt like when I was with her, we had such a great conversation about her business and goals and where she started and all that, that it felt like we were on and off in five minutes. On the way here, because I was just exhausted and tired and I had nobody to talk to, I felt like it was a 20 hour flight. It was an hour flight, but I was entertained. My mind was not focusing on the chair I was sitting in. It wasn't focusing on the, the fact that I can't get out easily to go to the restroom. It wasn't focused on me being you know, bored and wanting to get off this plane. I was able to focus on this person that was keeping me like entertained or, or focused on something else. So with you, with the spin instructors, if it's just up, down, up, 
down, if that's all they're doing, then all I'm thinking about is up, down. And you know what? I was already thinking about that without you. Yeah. Cause every time I go up, I'm like up again, you know? But if the person's like saying funny stuff or they're, they're, they're keeping me entertained or they're improving like really funny things along the way, like I'm kind of thinking about what's the next joke going to be or like, what's the next thing going to say? And, and it goes by like that. It's yeah. easier to keep, keep in shape. So is that a good example? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I've got a couple of questions I want to finish on, but before that, I'd like to, cause you know, there's, there's, you've got a lot of dimensions to your business, a lot of ways you can help people. First, just you know, give us an overview of how people can find more out about what you guys do and learn about some of these things that we've started to talk about today. Yeah, so we've got loudrumor.com. That's our company website. Um, my handle everywhere is Mike RC Live. So on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, if you do whatever it is, forward slash Mike RC Live or at Mike RC Live, and my last name is spelled A-R-C-E. That's how you spell RC, so Mike RC Live. Um, yeah, you'll find all our stuff on there. We upload a ton of videos on YouTube uh, for the fitness space and really helping them succeed. All these great videos are, some range in a minute to three minutes long, some are about an hour long because I got my talks up there. So my mission is to really help this space. Um, we are a very out of shape country, and it's silly because we all do like working out. I mean, think when you were kids, what was your favorite thing to do as a kid? run, jump, like that was fun. We ran everywhere. Like I have, you know how many times I have to yell at my daughter to not run around the pool? She can't walk. <laughs> she wants to run, slow down, no running, right? How many times you have to tell your kids no running, stop running, right? And as an adult, now we're like, start running. <laughs> like, start Get running, stop walking, <laughs> start running, start <laughs> jumping, right? And so I think we naturally are designed to be active. And we're not designed to be 300 pounds. We're not designed to be 250 pounds. We're designed to be lean. We're designed to be active. We're designed to be healthy and energized. And I think we're happier that way. I'm happier. I, I've been on both sides where I was a little out of shape and now I was in shape. And I'll tell you right now, I'm more energized. I'm happy. I'm more confident. I work harder. I sleep better when I'm in shape. And what kind of, what, what would the world be like if, you know, there, uh, the amount of people that are out of shape were in shape? Well, how much faster would we go if we had more energy, if we had better thinking, if we had better relationships, if we had more confidence, how, how much further would mankind go? Much, much further. So for me, yeah, I mean, we're building a business and I'm impacting the lives of our customers, I'm impacting the lives of our employees, but on a deeper level, we're impacting all the members, all those members. We're talking, you know, almost hundreds, hundreds, thousands of members that we've been able to bring in now, work out and get in a better place. So leads, great, we're getting members, people now are joining a gym, but then on our content, it's helping these fitness studio owners learn how to be better studio owners and get these people to get to their goals much better and faster so that, hey, we're not just getting retention, you know, fill every time we just gotta fill up our retention bucket. It's like, no, we, we literally are making an impact. We can scale and we can help more people and we can get in better shape. Okay, great. So I know this is a difficult question and the one thing question is very relevant on the type of person that you're dealing with or type of business you're dealing with. But I'd like just for the sake of this sort of podcast session to, to get a few things that people could probably look at, take away or focus on. You're, you're, you're obviously aware and had experience of how the digital world, as you say, internet has really changed business for fitness owners and there's a huge amount of opportunity now. If there's a few things that they could sort of narrow down and look at outside of really doing a good job for their members, their intention, what would be a few areas that you'd say, look, you know, brush up on this, learn on this, Here's a few things that you know you probably want to get right. What, what you know? What could they take away from this conversation? Um, they've got to do number one exactly what they tell their customers to do. Um, if you want your members to get in better shape, you are telling them to live in the world of discomfort, right? Be uncomfortable, right? Work through that pain. It's good. You got to get through there. I know it's hard to not eat a carb, you know, for a few hours, but go ahead and do it, right? Make through this nutritional change, and eventually think that will be comfortable for you. Right, and you hear members say that where it's like, you know, oh, I hated eating this way, and then once I started eating this way, it became easier. Now I like prefer salad. Right now I can't go a day without going to the gym. I feel like off. Right, so great. Now that you know that and you teach it, live it. Do you like being behind the camera? No, it makes me uncomfortable. That's that doesn't make you uncomfortable. It makes everyone uncomfortable. Now go ahead and do it. Right, go ahead and, and get right there in front of the lens and talk. You know the info already. If your members ask you, hey, what should I eat before I go to bed? Should I eat or is it bad to eat before I go to bed? Can you answer that question? Yes. Okay, great. Tell the world, expand your microphone. 
right? And you will suck at first. Don't expect to be great and say, okay, no, it's not for me. I can tell, look how bad my video is. No, it's bad, it's supposed to be bad. They all start bad. <laughs> they all start bad. You know, all your first push-up looked like shit. Your first push-up looked stupid. You're probably dipping your hip, right? You're probably not going all the way down. Your neck's probably all crooked. So then all of a sudden you just learn, how, you get comfortable. Now it's like, you don't know how to do a weird push-up. Like you only know how to do them with perfect form. So be uncomfortable. If it's uncomfortable for you to uh, get in front of the camera and talk to the audience and post it, then do it. If it's uncomfortable for you to start a podcast, but you know you got that good voice, then do it. If it's uncomfortable for you to host an event where you can get in front of your members and talk to them, then do it. If it's uncomfortable for you to reach out to strategic partnerships, like um, you know other people in the community that may be massage therapists, chiropractors, acupuncturists, cryotherapy places, um, all, these, all these other people that are serving a market that you also wanna serve, people that spend more money on being healthier, if it's uncomfortable for you to do that, do it. And it'll become more comfortable as you go. My first cold call was uncomfortable and then you start getting comfortable with it. It's like at the end of the day, I'm in the same spot. So yeah, you do a video, you're in the same spot. You're not gonna go backwards because you upload a video unless it's, you know, inappropriate. Then, you know, like, like you do something like really off character and weird. But um, I think you gotta live outside of your comfort zone if you wanna grow in fitness and relationships and business. If you, if you wanna grow, You've got to stretch outside of, as long as you're in comfort zone, you're only doing the things you already know how to do well, and so you'll be as good as you are today, always. Yeah. And just on that, because I know a lot of people, you know, the internet, video, what you can do nowadays is, you know, is, the cost is really, really, well, it's, it's free basically, and, and the amount of people you can reach is huge, but a lot of people do have that fear of, you know, sticking the camera on front of them and really taking advantage of that. You, I've, I've watched your podcast, and a lot of people will watch them, and they're, very highly produced, beautiful piece of work. Mm -hmm. Were you pretty crap when you started as well? <laughs> you, well, you're going to my body tomorrow, right? Yeah. Well, are you gonna watch my talk on Wednesday? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm actually showing a clip of one of my first videos. I had no beard, I had a weird haircut, I was a little chubbier and less tan. <laughs> you're, you're seeing me after summer. But it is a total different, I'm messing up, I'm looking back at the screen, I'm like, I'm off, my, my energy's different. You know, I wasn't myself because I wasn't in my comfort zone. And that's fine. You're not yourself no matter what, if you get outside of your comfort zone. Like right now, I'm myself when I cold call because I'm in my comfort zone, I can cold call. But let's say you were like, hey Mike, we're gonna go to a party and we go to a party and it's like a bunch of weird things going on that I just don't know about, then I'm uncomfortable. And I will not be myself at that party. I just won't be. Now, if for some reason this party shows valuable enough to me to keep going to 50 times, by that 50th time on myself, would you see that happening? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so anything you do for the first time, you're, you're uncomfortable on a first date. I mean, you could say, oh no, I'm super comfortable. No, you're, you're, there's this comfort there and you're not yourself. Trust me, and six months later, that guy will see a different girl. <laughs> yeah, that girl will see a different guy, right or wrong. You're not yourself on the first date. You are what you think that person wants you to be. You're not yourself you know, it, when you're in a prospect meeting. You're who you think that person wants you to be. You're, you're who you are the most when you're with your kids, when you're with your wife, when you're with your mom, your dad, why? Because you're so comfortable around them that that's when they see you. Yeah. So just do it often enough, do anything often enough, it becomes a part of you, becomes your comfort zone. Next thing you know, you're yourself and you're doing it great and now it's the next thing to stretch to. Yeah, I think that's the thing. It's like, just because you suck at the moment, don't let that be a reason to stop continuing. You know, you will get better. And um, I, I guess, and, and coming back to your point, which I think is a really important one, which I didn't think of from the beginning, but you know, if you're doing this because you're generally caring for the people that you want in there, your intention's great, then who cares if, you, you know, if your haircut's not good and you've not got a beard? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. And, and you know, for every fitness studio or gym owner that's watching this, you know, when a person comes in, and, say, and let's say you're training them for the first time and you're wanting to teach them how to do lunges and their form's all bad and you're like, okay, just make sure your knees are over, your over your ankle. And they do and you're like, okay, you're still not doing it. Okay, just make sure, breathe out on the way up. Okay, you're still not doing it. If that person goes, oh, I'm never gonna get this. What's that trainer gonna say? What do you think that trainer will say? When the, when the member says, first time you're doing it, oh, I'm doing it wrong, I'm not gonna get this. I'll never get this. What do you think that trainer's gonna say? Well, same thing as they should say if they suck at video. It's like, look, we're going to get there. You know, let's just keep we're going. We're going to get there. Let's do it again. <laughs> One step at a time. We'll get there. We'll get there. So that's what I'm telling everybody here. Yeah, absolutely. You'll get there. You'll get there. So if you don't believe me, then you shouldn't be telling other people to do it because then you're a hypocrite, yeah. right? You, you're, you're, you're this guy that's telling people what to do, like you're this motivational person. In reality, you're a wimp. Yeah. So you're either going to be strong and lead people that way or you're going to be a wimp. 
you know the answers. You just got to do it. And now if you choose to not do it, then, you know, then don't, don't ask questions while your members are, are quitting on you because yeah. they're seeing it through you. You learn by watching, not by learning. You can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. You got to get on the damn bike. You know, my kids are, I, I work, I could work 18 hours a day. I've, done, I've worked for a few years, 18 hours a day consecutively, not because my dad was a bum. My dad worked 18 hours a day. I didn't know any other way, you know? And if, it, you know, everybody tells their kids, you got to work, your, you got to do your best. You got to do your best. Everyone here would tell their kids that. You got to do your best. Oh, honey, if you fail, don't let, just get back on and do it again. Don't worry about the other kids. Don't worry about what they say. You go out there and you work hard. Everybody would say that. Okay, do we do it as adults? Do we worry about what other people think and say? Do we fail and get back up just as fast as we failed? Do we do our best or do we do good enough? Because if that's the case, you're a hypocrite and I don't care what you tell your kids to do, they'll see it, they feel it, they vibe off of it and they're gonna become exactly like you were. Yeah. Exactly like you were. Unless some mentor comes in out of nowhere and, and pushes them to a great point. But if you're their mentor with enough training, you're gonna train them the way you've been, you've been working. Yeah. So same thing for you. You've gotta know that. You've gotta become the person that your members can believe in because you live it. You work hard, you go outside of your comfort zone, you test new things without fear. Or if you do have that fear, you do it anyway. And all this stuff running a business is gonna require you to get outside of that comfort zone and deal with that pain just as much as all your members. Yeah. You gotta do it anyway. Yeah, it's a great example. And I guess it's about being authentic, you know, like show yourself out there to the people and flaws included, I guess. Flaws are fine. <laughs> yeah. My kids know all my stuff. They know, yeah. I, I, I talked to them about where I messed up. I talked to them when I messed up. You know, we, we had some culture issues back in January, February, we messed up and my kids know about it. Well, at least my son knows about it. My daughter just doesn't, you know, she's seven. But my son, he's 11, we talked about it. You know, he's asked why, and I tell him, like, I messed up here, I did this, I did that. He's like, why? And I said, ah, you know, the last stuff going on, and it was hard, and I got distracted by a lot. And, you know, he gets it. But, but, because what I'm, I don't want my son to think that I'm perfect, because when he fails, he can't live up to that. Yeah. He's gonna think that, oh man, I'm not my dad. No, you are your dad. You, because your dad messes up just like you do. The difference is, look what your dad does after he messes up, you yeah. know? And so for, for my kid, I don't want him to live with this expectation of he's flawless, right? My kid knows I sucked at school, but I tell him like what I wish I could do and, and why I'm like, now I learn so much, I read so much and I pay, I'm paying more now than the average college student is per year to get trained. I spent $100,500 last year in coaching. That's more than a year of college, I think in most or any schools. So I spend more now, I tell my son that, like look, value the education, I value it now, I wish it was sooner. Yeah. But I tell my son to school. So yeah, be transparent, be authentic, and don't let people believe you're something that you're not. Like be vulnerable so they can feel like you and, and work like so you. they can connect as well, I guess. You know. Yeah, the disconnect of you being perfect and then not, that's gonna mess them up. Yeah, absolutely. So final question, Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've either previously told yourself is impossible or maybe other people around you have said that's not possible. What would be a recent example of you escaping your own personal limits? That was a great one. Um, we had nine people quit our company, all female, in a matter of two months, three months. It was bad. And, and I bet you we had half of the remaining on, on edge here or there, you know, and um, that was really, really tough. I, I you know, I, I started focusing on a lot of projects more than I think I could handle. I was spending time with a cousin that I think needed my help. He was in a real, real bad place. And I think unfortunately I took more of him than he took of me. And, and I think I started getting a little negative and you know, it took a lot of things to happen for me to finally be like, holy shit, I got to restructure like what I'm thinking about here. I stopped hanging out with him a little bit more and I started to meet with the team a lot more and we started like thinking about things a little differently and you know, we've been great. Everything's been great. Um, you know, we've got a great culture right now and um, I feel really happy about the place that we're going and people aren't quitting and people are staying. People are asking if their friends can come, you know, and so I, I think that that is an example of a limit where it's like, you know, I had an issue and I could have said at that point, like, all right, screw it. It's my way or the highway. They don't want to be here. They don't have to be here. Or, you know, maybe this isn't for me or whatever, but it's not about that. Like life was tough at that point. That was, that was one of the hardest times in a few years for me. But now it's like, all right, how do we get there? I stopped focusing on certain projects I was focusing on. I started focusing more on this and 
that limit was knocked down. The, it felt like a real limit. Like it got to a bad place. It got like, and when I say bad, it wasn't bad like Sue and stuff like that. It's bad for keep in mind the year before we won best place to work. Right. Yeah. So for me, bad is like just not living up to where I know we could and should be. Yeah. And we were far from where, the best place to work. So I think that's really tough. The podcast initially was tough. So there, there's a ton of things. Everything's you got a limit to everything. Everything you're, you got a limit right now. This podcast, you have your limits to it. But I've watched your show get better as we've gone. Your show is cool now. You've got like you know, these cool effects that you do with like the red. I saw this one where you had like people pop out of a red like filter or something. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> yeah, well, like, he's getting better too. <laughs> so you're all getting better, right? So my show's advanced, everything gets better. So everything's got a limit because of financial, because of intellectual, because of experience, because of ideas. Everything's got a limit because of that. But as long as you keep going out and learning, that's why I say mentorship's so important. As long as you keep learning and then you always keep in the back of your mind that if you test something and fail, you'll literally be back in the same spot you would have been if you didn't do it anyway. As long as you keep those two things in alignment, constantly learning and not having the fear, the limits will exist, but you will, you will expand the limit, right? You, you won't, I don't know if you'll break the limit. You'll expand the limit. It's almost like saying, I'm not gonna, I'm, you can speed 80 miles an hour when the limit's 55, or you can convince a town to raise the speed limit to 80, yeah, okay. right? So. In this case, it's more like, okay, how do we expand the limit? So like now that's not a limit anymore. And then we can do that. Now there's that limit there again. How can we expand the limit? Like right now we're shooting here, right? That's, I, I'm with you on that. Then now we're building studios out, right? And we're flying people in instead. Now that limit doesn't exist. It did, it doesn't anymore. Now we can hit that point. Then there'll be something else. Yeah, constantly expanding that circle, I guess. Yeah. So some great stuff there. I think one of the things that I really have taken away, and you know, when I came into it, I watched what you'd done and, and looked at a lot, a lot of sort of tactical strategic stuff. And I, I think sometimes as business owners, we can overthink things. We can, we can almost like get ourselves in a position of not moving forward because we don't know what to do. And, and I, I really like the way that you brought it down into some very basics. It's like, do the right thing. Look after your customers, the same as you're doing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the rest of the stuff will work itself out. And then whatever platform and technology you use to do that, you know, it's fine, but it's, it's, it is very simple mm -hmm. and, and, and timeless. So I appreciate your time. I recommend people do check out the podcast and the website because I've certainly learned a lot. He's got some amazing guests on there with some, with, you know, some fantastic information. Mike, I really appreciate your time I today. I appreciate it too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take yep. care. Thanks. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.